My name is Rafael Carranza. I cover the U.S.-Mexico border for the Arizona Republic and the USA Today Network. Mexico is Arizona's number one trading partner. Last year, the two shared over $15 billion in trade. A lot of that is due to the North American Free Trade Agreement, which has facilitated trade between the three North American countries. However, the future of that remains uncertain as the sixth round of negotiations start this week. Okay, uh, so let's go to the first question on this. I think, uh, Commissioner Stump, you're up. Um, the massacre in Las Vegas last year um, raised the question of what, if anything, we should be doing about um, uh, to trying to prevent such carnage in the future. Um, do we need to make any changes to federal gun laws or mental health uh, in this country? Uh, if not, do we have to accept the risk of this kind of event in, as a fact of American life? Sure, Rob. Well, let me just say first, uh, I received an A-plus from the NRA, and I think there's no more fundamental right than the right to self-defense. However, the issue of bu bump stocks has come up, and basically, as some of your viewers may know, a bump stock is basically a semi-automatic -autom weapon that is converted into an automatic weapon. And I, I know even members of the Freedom Caucus are looking that, at that as a possible source of legislation. The sale of fully automatic firearms has actually been uh, basically legal in the country since 1986, and in my mind, bump stocks would probably fall under that category. But you know, quite candidly, I think a gun-free zone is like a welcome mat to criminals. And so I think it's perfectly reasonable to allow qualified, trained uh, teachers to carry weapons in schools. I think you need to give the good guys a fighting chance. And uh, so we need to enforce the laws on the book, books and look at other creative mechanisms, mechanisms such as that to, again, let the good guys have a fighting chance against criminals who are going to ignore whatever law, sadly, is on the books. Senator Montenegro. I want you to repeat the question one more time. Um, yeah, so uh, do we need to make any changes to federal gun laws or mental health resources in this country, or do we just need to accept that this kind of violence is a fact of American life? Look, I, I think it's kind of wrong to say that this kind of fact is uh, there for American life. I think that it's, I, I think evil is evil, and we have to call it out when it is. And the truth is that there are no laws that will stop evil. Um, a deranged person is going to come and be evil to everybody. Kill at, I don't care what laws are in the books, I think we've seen that in, uh, in history. Many occasions there have been evildoers that come in and step into schools, uh, movie theaters where there are people that are um, innocently enjoying a time with their family. So evil is evil. What we need to do is make sure that we're protecting our Constitution. There's a reason the founders gave us a Constitution with the Second Amendment. And I think that I don't, I don't want, I actually want to see us get rid of laws because usually it's the good guys that are carrying that end up being the heroes. Representative Lovis. I'm pro-gun freedom. Uh, in the legislature, I was endorsed by the NRA and A-rated. Some of cities like Chicago that have some of the toughest gun control laws have some of the highest crime. So it's the criminals, it's not the guns. Uh, even in the UK today, you, the UK has some of the toughest gun control laws. There's a, there's a slogan right now, there's a campaign, surrender your knife, save a life. Mm -hmm. So that's where it's gone to in the UK. Again, it's the criminals, not the weapon. Senator Lesko. Well, I'm a pro Second Amendment supporter. I have a proven track record of it. I've been rated A by the NRA and A plus by the Arizona Citizens Defense League and I'm a member of both. No, I don't believe we need any more gun laws. Um, we need to protect the constitutional Second Amendment rights of law-abiding citizens to defend themselves. Mr. Van Steenwijk. I, well, I believe I'm A rated by the Arizona gun owners. I can safely say I'm the only one up here that held a rally at the Capitol with over 3,000 people showing up to uphold the Second Amendment. The problem isn't the guns, it's the people that own them. I wasn't robbed twice in L.A. by a gun. I was robbed twice in L.A. by illegals holding guns. If I'd have had a gun, I wouldn't have gotten robbed. But in California, as most people know, even back then, I couldn't carry a gun. You're not allowed to. They mentioned Chicago. How about the atrocities of hundreds of people killed there every year? Vegas was unfortunate, and yes, the guy must have been mentally ill. But that means everybody in Chicago is mentally ill, and the mayor is definitely mentally ill for letting this go on, and in New York, and in L.A., and in Las Vegas, and in every major city in this country. The guns 
If you use a gun when you commit a crime, there should be automatic jail time. We're allowing some people to walk free on this. It's not the Second Amendment that's a problem. It's a lack of enforcement of the people that illegally obtain guns and then use them on others. That's where we need to go. Go after the criminal and leave the gun owner, the legal gun owner, the citizen alone. Okay. Uh, next question. Um, the, according to NASA, 2016 was the Earth's hottest year on record, and 2017 was the second hottest. Uh, nine of the ten hottest years in Phoenix have happened since 2002. Show of hands, do you believe in human-caused climate change? Well, that's okay. a loaded question. Yeah. <laughs> no. Go ahead, William. Well, you know, is some of it maybe human caused? Possibly, but certainly not the majority of it. I think it just goes through cycles and it has to do a lot with the sun. So, no, I'm not a global uh, warming um, proponent. Okay. Did I hear anyone else? Yeah. Okay. I would say if you look at the weather they're having back east right now, nobody back there believes that. And for all the other environmentalists that probably don't study enough as they should, do you know that America now has more trees here than we had when the pilgrims landed here? But once again, because of a government agency, the Forestry Service, they've hindered us harvesting trees in our forests, which is one of the things that's causing all the fires. So if we just did what we used to do, where loggers could come in, clean areas out, get all the dead wood out, harvest the trees, like a farmer does every year. He only plants so much corn on so many acres because if he plants too much, he's going to get less and not as good, not a good corn. We need to turn this back over to people that understand it. And one of the people that don't understand it, the federal government controls more land in Arizona than we do. And the federal government has no constitutional authority to own any land other than a military base and D.C. That's it. Okay. And Commissioner Stump? Yeah, thanks, Ron. You know, and I, I spent the past eight years trying to keep energy prices low and make sure that Arizona does not become like California. To give an example, they have a cap-and-trade program that has reduced carbon emissions by 0.3 percent. The recent uh, tragic wildfires have wiped all of those gains out, and yet the people of California have suffered, their pocketbooks have suffered, basically for nothing. That's what I work to prevent happening in Arizona, and I think that's what other commissioners uh, need to emphasize throughout the United States. I think California is a lost cause, at least for now. Thankfully, Arizona okay. is not. Okay. Um, next question. Um, Senator Montenegro, the administration has backed out of the Trans-Pacific uh, Partnership and reopened negotiations on NAFTA. Uh, Mexico is um, Arizona's number one trade partner. Um, should we be ending NAFTA? Do you think that's good for Arizona? You know, I think that, uh, first of all, I want folks to know that I am a free trader. I believe in the free market, and I believe that we have to make sure that we have an environment or an, an ambience where people can be the masters of their own destiny. And when it, when, it comes to, uh, when it comes to agreements, we'd rather there not be uh, government stepping in and regulating. We understand that there are some. Uh, for something like NAFTA, I am in favor of reopening it or opening it and making sure that we are renegotiating. There, certainly there are things there that are not uh, favorable to American companies, American jobs, and the American economy. And frankly, we need to make sure that we are always looking out for America first. And we're making sure for, we're looking out for Americans in any agreements that we make. Representative Lois. I support fair trade as well and, and support free trade. Uh, but we need to put American workers first. And the fact is, uh, I'd love to see low tariffs across the board across every country. But countries do cheat. And we know China was manipulating their currency for about 10 years. We do know that other countries, the government controls the banks. The banks then control which private companies get the, get the loans. And they decide whether they, the company can buy American goods or whether they need to buy domestically. So I certainly support President Trump in renegotiating NAFTA, and not just NAFTA, but other trade deals we have. Another big problem is that countries steal our intellectual property. That's been going on for a while now. I've got a friend in the district who's an exporter. Countries have been stealing his intellectual property. He then has to sue in that country where they've got weak IP laws, and it's very problematic to try to get any kind of justice in some foreign countries for him. Senator Lesko. I agree with President Trump. We need to renegotiate NAFTA and we need to modernize it. It's, it's old and, and outdated. There's been new technologies since it's been drafted. Mr. Van Steen. NAFTA was negotiated on a false premise to begin with. It opened our borders up to trade, but it wasn't what you'd call fair or free. We have a deficit with Mexico, everybody seems to forget. Plus, they get to bring truckloads of food into this country 
without any tariffs or any costs on trucks that we don't even allow our drivers here to run. You have companies in Mexico, such as the Grumman Corporation, which controls the Maseca industry, which is where all your corn tortillas come from, and Bimbo Company, who's little by little buying every baking company like Wonder Bread, Weber's, and the others up because of these treaties. These are dangerous to our own safety and our food line. And then you have wackos in California who pass laws so our, our farms there can't grow crops and we're importing, importing inferior fruits and vegetables from south of the border. And I know they're inferior because I was in the food business and I've watched this treaty destroy American companies and jobs. And actually it helped bring about some of the illegal immigration because of the deals we made on corn. It put a lot of corn farmers in Mexico out of business. And there it was a family farm, but the family there was 50 to 70 people. And they had no work and no money, so guess where they came? Here. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Stone. Ron, I think NAFTA should not be ditched and it should indeed be, be uh, modernized. You know, it's an important point, I think, to make. Uh, the administration has said specifically with regard to Russia and China that their goal is to make the world economy less free and less fair. And I think that's precisely the case. And I think the administration is right on point in identifying China and Russia as really the two culprits that are anti-free trade. Phil mentioned uh, uh, China. They're actually under investigation by the Congress now, rightfully so, for uh, demanding of businesses that they hand over their intellectual property as a price to pay for entering the world's second economy. That's certainly wrong, and I think the administration, again, is exactly on the right course in singling both of them out, both of those countries, uh, for investigation. Okay. Uh, next question. Uh, this is for Representative Lovis, I think. Um, the regime in North Korea says it now possesses deliverable nuclear weapons. Uh, realistically, what should America now do to manage that situation? Well, President Trump had to come in after 25 years of mismanagement regarding North Korea. They should never have got to this point where they are on the verge of hitting the United States with a nuclear weapon. Um, really, we've got a couple different options. We can do a military strike. We can negotiate. Um, you know, really, there are not good options at this point. Uh, quite frankly, I, I trust the President, I trust the State Department, and I trust the Pentagon to make the right decision. Senator Lesko. Well, I agree with the um, term peace through strength. I think we need to increase funding to our military, s strengthen our military. Um, we have Luke Air Force Base in Congressional District 8, and it trains the most number of F-35 and F-16 pilots. It's government's number one job is to protect its people. And so I really believe we need to strengthen the military, and I think that will help with countries like North Korea and others. Mr. Van Steenweg. North Korea has been a threat to us since its existence. We have been blackmailed, cajoled, tricked ever since it came into being. And we've allowed this to go on because every president thought they could kick the can down the road, similar to Social Security, and let the next guy take care of it. And nobody did. It's now sort of being taken care of. Personally to me, if, if you've got the bomb and we feel threatened by it and we know you're going to use it or you shoot off another rocket, then why don't we just drop something down in that little area because we can pinpoint prick bomb people. I had an advisor when I ran against Mr. Frank's last section, and he's in the Air Force, and he flies the spy planes. And the things he told me that our Air Force can do, our military is capable of, made me rest very well at night. I wish the American people all knew what we could do because some of the threats they tell us we have, in essence, we don't have some of them, but it does keep some of the federal spending up. Some of the military spending is wasteful. That needs to be cut. But to defend this country, which is the primary goal of a federal government, we need to not only be willing to have the, the ability to defend ourselves, we need to use it when it's necessary and not just threaten to use it. Commissioner Stump. Well, there's this diplomatic term called strategic ambiguity, and it seemed counterintuitive to me when I first heard about it, but what it means basically is that the administration's unpredictability on foreign policy matters can actually be a sign of strength. And that seems counterintuitive, but let's look at the results. The South Korean president actually credited President Trump with pushing North Korea into discussions with the South several weeks ago. They're sending athletes to the Olympics in South Korea now. North and South have come together to discuss military tension reduction. So. Uh, again, it may seem counterintuitive, but something is working. And Debbie met, mentioned peace through strength. Absolutely. You know, President Obama, quite frankly, talked about red lines in the sand with Syria. That ended up being simply 
blown away by the sands of his caprice, as far as I'm concerned. President Obama would offer an olive branch to jihadists. He would get a sword in return. Thankfully, that all has changed now. Senator Montenegro. So foreign policy is largely set by uh, the president of the United States, the executive branch. So um, I think that it's important for us to work with President Trump. Um, I actually live about half a mile away from Luke Air Force Base. Every morning I, I wake up to the sound of freedom. And I sleep very safely and I feel very safe as well. So we need to make sure that we understand uh, when it comes to foreign policy, I subscribe to foreign policy that allows um, our country the maximum ability to have options. And that means that we don't bind ourselves, we don't tie our hands, but we make sure that we have the maximum capability of having all the options at the table. And that's how, that's for uh, national security. That's ensuring that we, um, as Americans, we're protecting, we're protected. That's what the Constitution states that the government does. And frankly, as, as a legislature, Congress, we need to make sure that our, our military installations are properly funded, that we're looking out for our veterans, that we're making sure that we are uh, meeting our commitments and making sure we're safe. Okay. Uh, last question. This is the wild card question. Uh, this is for uh, Mr. Van Steenwijk. All, five, all four of the other candidates here tonight have elective experience. Uh, they have survived competitive campaigns. They have taken tough votes. Uh, they have had to answer uncomfortable questions from people like me. Um, <laughs> You've been on the ballot off and on a couple times yeah. um, and collected what amounted to what some might see as a protest vote against a comfortable <coughs> incumbent. Mm -hmm. um, why should voters look at your campaign and see it as anything more than an indulgence on your part? Well, let's see. The last time I ran against Senator Congressman Franks was 2016, just not even two years ago. The gentleman spent $270,000 as an incumbent to run against a challenger who spent $4,000. Yeah, I've challenged incumbents. I've never challenged someone that either wasn't an office holder, what I consider to be career politicians, or an incumbent. I challenged Jeff Flake. I come from a business perspective and having to get things done. I've testified down at the Capitol a number of times on bad bills that they passed anyway, even knowing and being warned they violated the Arizona Constitution. They voted for them in spite of that because the governor wanted it. I am not a friend, we'll say, of the septic tank GOP management of Arizona, all right? I never have been, I never will be. I have been fighting the Republican Party's corruption for years. That is why I never get any help from the Republican Party, quite frankly. I don't expect any in this race. I believe I am the only one up here who can honestly say I've never taken a dime from a lobbyist, a PAC, a bureaucrat, or direct orders from the governor about how to vote on something and followed them. Okay, thank you.